Inclusivity starts with I. Therefore, it starts with I as in I do the work in understanding the inequities and quit placing your information gathering solely on the shoulders of women, POC, LGBTQIA, disabled and marginalized communities. It is I who checks my own biases, conscious and unconscious, making a promise to when we see a transgression, we don't see it in silence. Things in this space can get uncomfortable because when we see it in yourself, you may become defensive, that shows a fragility in a system you once believed. And in these conversations, we may feel tension and we may feel out of place, finding ourselves in an ironic space. Maybe in that moment you will see why it is so important to offer people space who for so long have not been offered space, denied a place in common places, for a thing about them they didn't choose is an ineffable type of abuse. And so now we must do. And it starts with understanding the person next to you. It's being empathetic. It's a kindness without bias. That love is free, and I so I implore you to try it. And as we sit here today looking for new ways to nourish, nourish our community and uplift the other, we first need to listen to each other, knowing that this hate was taught and the deconditioning will hurt. Yet that will never come close to understanding the generations of people who were, to who were told they had no worth. And it's with that I would like to introduce our speaker for today, Hilary Van Dyke. All right, so as Tara said, my name is Hillary Van Dyke. I'm the Senior Professional Development Coordinator for Pinellas County Schools. I'm also a volunteer leader for Outdoor Afro St. Pete in Tampa Bay, and I'm a Courageous Conversations affiliate for the Foundation for Healthy St. Pete. And my work, my professional work, is basically related to diversity and inclusion, and so that's why I was invited today to be the speaker for Inclusive. Before we get started, I need to get some things situated. I have an attention signal. Can I walk this way? Is it gonna? Okay, I'm safe. Um, so when I say, hey class, you respond by saying, hey teach. If I change how I say it, you change how you say it. Let's practice that real quick. Hey class. Hey teach. Hey class. Hey teach. Hey class. Hey teach. Beautiful. So that's what I use. You're going to talk a few times during this, and that's what I use to get your attention back. The other thing that we need to get situated is your turn and talk partners. So this will be like one or two people near you who you will have your conversations with when we have the talk breaks. So figure out who those folks are, and if you don't know them, introduce yourself real quick as well. You've got like 10 seconds. <laughs> Beautiful. All right, so throughout, I'll refer to these people as your besties. All right, so let's get rolling. I am super comfortable in white spaces, or rather that's a facade I'm well practiced in portraying. There's a variety of reasons why this is necessary for my survival and my success, and there are a variety of ways in which our society has been systemically and systematically created so that this is my reality while some of you don't have to think about that as a consideration at all. What I want for you to take away from this conversation is not a feeling of guilt. Did it click? All right, cool. All right, so what I want you to take away from this conversation is not a feeling of guilt. In fact, author Robin DiAngelo says that when we are mired in guilt, we are narcissistic and ineffective. So what I want you to take away from this is empowerment through awareness. And I need you to remember that despite what we have been socialized to believe, there is nothing inherently wrong with any race. Now, my first real formative memory of racial awareness was in the fifth grade. Um, can you click it? <laughs> I know, I know, I know. 
Um, so this, obviously I'm not a fifth grader in this picture, but I like these because you can see the, my hair situation, which was like <laughs> this, but in the fifth grade it was longer. And my mother would braid my hair, and one of the days for school, she did like two French braids on my back, and for some reason I came home, despite how long it took her to braid the hair, and I took the braids out. So then the next day for school, I was like, you know, do, let's do my hair. My mom basically said, hell no. She didn't like literally say hell no, but it was a no. So for the first time that I can remember, I had to figure out how to do my own hair for school. So raise your hand if you've seen Coming to America. Yeah, okay, I like it. So at the beginning, that first princess that he was maybe gonna marry, she had hair a lot like mine, had the half up, half down situation. So I was like, all right, I'm gonna do that hairdo. Was feeling pretty good about myself. Had my little half up, half down hair, get to school. And when they did the morning announcements, they'd roll like the TV card out. Who had the TV card? Yeah, yeah, I like it. Um, and I sat in the front, because I'm a nerd, and one of the kids in the back, don't remember her name, had long, straight, blonde hair, raised her hand, and said, I can't see past Hillary's hair. Um, and my teacher made me move to the back, instead of asking that student to just move her desk over a little bit, or her chair over. Um, and for the rest of that day, and probably the next day, maybe however long I had my hair like that, I had to sit in the back of the room. So she sent a really clear message to me about my hair. Um, and I could share like a million other stories related to that. But I shared this one because it had such a profound impact on my perception of my beauty, especially as it was wrapped up in my hair. At the end of that school year, my mom had my sister and my hair chemically relaxed to be straight. Uh, but I was so happy that I was gonna have straight hair. And then for 22 years, I wore my hair like that. So this little moment in time, that teacher taught me something that I apparently wasn't beautiful enough the way that I was. Um, and she's probably never thought about that since then, but to me, it had a pretty serious impact. So what I want you to think about is your first moment of racial awareness or like the moment you realize that race was the thing that mattered in our world, as you think about your like earliest memory of realization of race, I need you to learn some rules of engagement because you will be talking about this to your best in a moment. Uh, the book Courageous Conversations About Race is by Glenn Singleton and it's a field guide for achieving equity in schools. The first four agreements come from Courageous Conversations. So the first one asks that you stay engaged. For this like 20 minutes that I have you, I need you to keep your conversation to be about race or ethnicity, I'll allow race or ethnicity. If you bring up gender, sexual orientation, or any other social identity, please make sure it's at the intersection of race. You can do it for 20 minutes. Two, speak your truth. What happens in Station House stays in Station House, right? So just make sure that you're being honest with your besties as you share your story. Three, experience discomfort. Uh, and I ask that you experience discomfort gracefully. If you start to feel some type of way, start to feel emotional, remember that you are an adult and that's on you to handle. Don't make anyone else in the room have to comfort you. Uh, four, accept, expect and accept non-closure. A lot of times what happens when we talk about race, people just wanna jump right to action without respecting the idea of conversation is action. And finally, I've added listen for understanding because I think if you ask those four things of people, then we need to make sure we're actually listening to understand them and not just listening to argue. And number three is experience discomfort. <laughs> All right, so these are my rules of engagement for dialogue, but I'm also gonna ask you that if your story includes the word black or African-American or any other race or ethnicity, don't do the whisper, y'all. And y'all know what I'm talking about, you know? When people are like, that black guy over there. No, just, just say the word. Be bold and courageous in your conversations. I'm going to give you four minutes to talk to your besties, and it's four minutes only, so please share the airtime. Don't be that guy. Y'all ready? Four minutes. Talk to your besties about your first moment that you realized what race was and that it had something to do with differences. Go. Hey, class. Hey, teach. Bonjour, class. Bonjour, teach. 
All right, all right. It's pretty good, pretty good. All right, so walking around, creeping on y'all, I heard that these stories existed in some fashion for everyone. Uh, they occurred at a wide range of ages, but I bet if you keep thinking, some of you will realize that you had a moment of awareness even earlier. Maybe it wasn't as blatant as what you shared with your bestie. Maybe it was noticing that folks in your neighborhood or in your classroom all look the same. Maybe as a person of color, when you were watching television or movies, you noticed that people that looked like you always played the same negative roles. Maybe when your teacher taught you something about a black person, you had that moment of, is it Black History Month? <laughs> um, or maybe you didn't notice this at all, which is the genius of racism. Our society, through policies and economic inequality and discrimination, has been made so that folks that look like the dominant group in the room and folks that look like me stay apart. The fact is that we were all raised in a society that taught us there was no loss in the absence of people of color, that their absence was a good and desirable thing to be sought and maintained while simultaneously denying that fact. In your own life, I want you to think about the folks behind me in your world. I'm gonna read through this list. As I read, I want you to think about how many of these can you answer with people of color. Owners of the restaurants you ate at this week, your best childhood friend, the majority of your teachers slash professors, the author of your favorite book, your boss, the majority of your colleagues or classmates, your current neighborhood demographic, the, your first mentor, your doctor, your significant other, or your senator. Now for me, only four of these can be answered by people of, with people of color because the majority of my world is white. And what I want you and your bestie to talk about next is where you stack up on this list. So think about how many of these can be answered with people of color. I want you to also think about, have you ever even thought about this before? Or have you made any effort to try to change it? Um, if you don't know how to answer one of them, don't get hung up on that one, just move on, okay? Um, so again, I'll give you another four minutes to talk to your bestie, where do you stack up? Have you thought about this before? Have you made any effort to change it? Four minutes, go. Hey class. <laughs> that was beautiful. <laughs> All right, y'all. I am not suggesting that you go shopping for black and brown friends. Okay? That would be a really awkward conversation at McDinton's on Friday. But, and actually, let me back up. So I do have an acquaintance who I thought we were friends, or she thought we were friends, I don't know. But she invited me to a birthday thing in January, um, and basically as soon as I got there, she informed me that I was her token black friend. Oh. And, <laughs> that was it's a good reaction, I like it. Um, <laughs> and she also wanted me to join a book club she was in with some white women about learning how to talk about race. Um, so that might be what shopping for black and brown friends looks like, so don't do that. But what I am asking, and actually in that moment, she really just should have been like, hi, Hillary, good to see you. It's been a while, but anyway. Um, so I'm asking you to be aware of reality and to be aware of how insidious the messages we learn from segregation, media bias, and supposed color blindness are. The thing about insisting that you aren't racist or that your parents raise you to treat all people the same, or that you're colorblind, or that you don't care if the person is black, purple, or polka dotted, <laughs> or that you were the only white person at your school, or that you grew up on an integrated military base, or that your uncle's half-sister's baby cousin is black. <laughs> the thing about these assertions is they really just shut down the conversation and they don't allow for real dialogue. Take this story, for example. Um, like I said, I'm the volunteer leader for Outdoor Afro in St. Pete and Tampa Bay. 
And this day we were on a hike at Emerson Point Preserve. Um, and this is at the top of the tower. If you've never been there, it's beautiful. It's in Bradenton, definitely worth the trip. Anyhow, the man that ended up taking this picture, when he first came up to the top of the stairs, he was like, are you guys a church group? And I was like, no, we're just humans doing human things. Um, but it is kind of a funny story, right? But I'm sure in conversation, he would swear that he wasn't racist or that our color didn't impact how he treated us. But obviously from that interaction, he can see our color. And we could even get into the systemic reasons why it was a shock for him to see us at the park. Recreation areas in St. Pete and surrounding areas have only been integrated for like 50-ish years. National parks, state and local parks have only started having really real pushes for inclusion over the last five years or so. And there's, so there's a whole history to why our presence at this park would be a shock for someone like him. But I wonder if he would be willing to engage in dialogue about why he really should have just said hi to us and if that conversation could have happened without defensiveness. So again, I ask you to remember, despite what we have been socialized to believe, there's nothing inherently wrong with any race. What is wrong is the way that we're all kept from knowing each other. I implore you, when you walk away from this conversation, to keep doing your homework. It's not on me as a person of color to be your how to be an ally guide, unless you pay me. Um, I'm, just, I'm just saying, I'll do it for money, I'll do it for money. Um, that's real, y'all, you don't even know. Um, <laughs> but it's on you to do things, like Tara said, read the book White Fragility. I hear that it's difficult for white people, but I think it's worth the read. Um, listen to Seen On Radio Season 2, which is called Seeing White, 14 episodes, life-changing stuff. Watch groundbreaking docu-series about systemic racism. Um, BET has a show out right now called Finding Justice, and the first episode is about Pinellas County, so definitely <laughs> check it out. Um, and then follow the Green Book of Pinellas and Hillsborough on Instagram and Facebook. Uh, this will help you to be more intentional in supporting black-owned businesses, cultural sites, and artists. And on Fridays, we do Buy Black Fridays, which hopefully helps you to actually intentionally support a black-owned business at least once a week, like we all did this morning with Pop Goes the Waffle. Woo! <laughs> um, and then the Foundation for Healthy St. Pete, Google them, join their mailing, I don't know where I'm standing, join their mailing list uh, if you want to get connected into the conversation with race that's happening like monthly all the time through the foundation. Um, and the other thing that I'm going to ask you to do is to be bold in your conversations with your friends and family. Call them out when they're joking in ways that bring other people's humanity into question. And finally, I ask that you don't get awkward like that white guy at Emerson Point Preserve or my friend who called me a token and just say hi. Listen, I go to a lot of community events, and I've got two stipulations if you want to ask me a question, okay? One, what we not fit to do is, you know, when people get the mic and they talk for two minutes and they don't ask a question, we're not doing that. And two, can you go to the agreements? That's real, whoever's laughing over there. You know what I mean? You know what I mean, though? Stay engaged. We're not changing the topic from race. That's what I'm here to talk about. So if you don't want to talk about it, then maybe a question for someone else. All right, I'm ready. <laughs> Hi. Um, OK, so my question has to do with your story about when you were in fifth grade. Um, I work with children, um, and I have nieces. And um, if you witness something like that, if, if you are the teacher in that situation, What's the proper response? How do, you, how do you speak to the child that doesn't necessarily know that what they're saying is inherently based in racism? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so to the blonde child, I think, uh, well, first of all, I taught for uh, seven or eight years. And I used to, when kids would raise their hand and be like, I can't see over such and such his head, I would be like, then you move. <laughs> um, that's for real. That's a real reaction I would have. 
And when I started digging into my story, I was like, oh, that's why. Um, so, so I apologize to all those babies that I yelled at, because my bad. But the one thing I would say, the teacher just needs to say, move your chair. Just move your chair, right? Um, and then don't chastise children in front of other people, um, and that brings shame to them. But later, you could just say something to, this, to the girl on the side, just, hey, by the way, that might have hurt Hillary's feelings. She just has her hair in a different style today. You can just move your chair next time instead of calling it out. Hi, thank you so much for being here. Uh, my question is, have you been able to incorporate um, true stories into the education of children so that they're not reading a lot of history that is false in reference to racism? Working on it. <laughs> uh, a big push in our equity work, I'm just gonna call them out. Lucy Lancheros and Kimberly Skook, like, please stand up and wave. No, we're not gonna stand up? Just, just stand up. <laughs> All right, so I do a lot of the training of teachers, and these ladies get to go in the classrooms and actually help teachers bridge theory to practice. So between the training, um, we do a lot of work trying to make sure our teachers, administrators know the real narratives of at least local history. Um, some of the teachers also go through other specialized trainings where we talk more about learning about how fake history is that we learn. And if you are a nerd in the room, you should read James Lowen's Lies My Teacher Told Me. Yes, it's an amazing book, and it compares how our textbooks straight up just lied to us our whole lives. Like even the fact that, um, oh my gosh, I'm gonna try not to go down this rabbit hole. Just two ideas, two ideas of like false stories. One, um, we talked about with the Ray's staff a couple weeks ago, Jackie Robinson, the way you learn about it, you would think he was this like magical black man who could play baseball. But really, he's the first black man that white people allowed to play baseball. Now think about how different that story is versus the way we learn it. Like there were no other good black ball players but Jackie Robinson. Not true at all. Half the guys in the Negro Leagues could have just wiped out the MLB, but at that time they could not handle that. Black men beating the crap on the baseball field, not like punching, but like, you know. <laughs> anyway, so just thinking about narratives like that, the Rosa Parks thing, how we learn it as a lie. Um, and then another thing, how we sanitize white people from history, either like the allies or the, the bad guys, like John Brown, who had the raid against Harper's Ferry. Um, now the way he's taught, we are made to believe he was a crazy person. Because really, if you think about it, when history textbooks start being written, they're like, this white man was willing to die for black people? He wasn't crazy. But we get taught that he was crazy. Or if you think about Charles Lindbergh, who's Charles Lindbergh? Someone tell me what he did. What did he do? Flew across the Atlantic. What else happened to him that was sad? His baby was kidnapped. Did you guys know that he was also like the head of the first American Nazi party? <laughs> yeah, yeah. He was a big old Nazi, um, for real. And I mean like in 1939 to 1942, like during World War II, while Jews were being put into the camps right before they started being gassed, this man was trying to be our version of Hitler. So that's what I mean, like we just don't learn history, but we're trying, we're trying. <laughs> that was a rabbit hole, I'm sorry. Is there anything we can do as parents who are trying to get that education for our kids in Pinellas County Schools. You know, I'm, I'm one of those big advocates who fought for like recess and now I'm fighting against the testing, but I'm happy to fight to get more, <laughs> you know, <laughs> right? Like help our kids learn these stories. I mean, I was just shocked about that. Yeah. I didn't know that, um, so. One thing that you could request is maybe just talk to your school's principal and ask what their uh, uh, plans are related to equity work and culturally relevant teaching. Um, and then for your own student, just you can research a lot of uh, books about, the, what's, there's a website called Raising a Race Conscious Kid or something like that. Hold on, let me look real quick. I can tell you what it's called, because I want all the white babies to be better than, <laughs> than we is. Um, 
It's called Raising Race Conscious, Raising Race Conscious Children. There's a website and lots of resources okay. to be intentional, to help your, because we get socialized to believe this stuff and we don't realize it. So we have to be intentional to make sure that our next generation isn't socialized. This is the school board, right? I work for the school district, yeah. Right, for the district. So is the board working to do this? Because I'll tell you, yes. the big fight is yes. you go to the school to try to get the school to do what you need them to do. But yeah. like, oh, but you got to go to the board. board. Right. If yes, we're working on it. Okay. But you so can't just ask the question. The right. Yeah. Okay. Yep. No, real quick, I want to kind of piggyback off that. That courageous conversation that we talked about, we've had six city council members go through it. Had the president of the Tampa Bay race go through it. So we're trying to get as many people with the ability to change things in their in their networks. Um, we've had Pinellas County Schools, uh, many of the leaders in the Pinellas County Schools system go through this to have these conversations about race and then see how what they're doing is being affected by race. So again, I think it's just putting the medicine in the candy a lot of time. Um, <laughs> and then also bringing people in. You got to have the conversation. Yep. Cool. Oh wait, let me teach you a clap real quick. Oh yeah. Because I was like so good, right? So the clap that I like to have people do is an avid clap where you go one, two, one, two. All right? <laughs> so let's avid clap for Hillary Van Dyke. Ready, go. 